I just wanted to have these, um, these, these slides just to show that we have inputs on the left, we have outputs on the right, um, and then we have the um, output with the, the final result with the, with the posterior analysis. So again, we can get the user to play around with their survival probabilities, and then we can run the model, and then we can see what the results look like. I don't know if that's exactly consistent with uh, shelf guidelines or Sheffield expert elicitation guidelines. Um, so uh, apologies if that's uh, not, not correct, but this is more kind of a, a toy example than, than anything else. Um, so if that's okay, I'll show the actual model in OR. Um, of course, go for it. Okay, so um, here is the, the Shiny app, uh, very simple Shiny app, um, I might add. Um, but I think, I think in this initial toy example, it, it shows what we want to see. So here we have the option to um, see the, to, to change the slider in terms of, you know, what time point I want to consider. So if I'm an expert, I might or if I'm the decision, or if, if I want to enlist an opinion, I might say, well, what's the um, survival probability at 400 weeks? So I can just slide this over here. That's close enough. Um, and then I can ask the uh, um, expert to see okay, what's their prior belief of um, survival at this point, time point, and, and they can play around with this, um, with these sliders. And then um, I can, this is where it would need a little bit more work, but I can, I can select a bunch of distributions um, from this nice drop-down list and I can run the analysis. Um, hopefully it doesn't take too long. Um, I, like I said, I, I think I would optimize this actually in OR and, and not write it in STAN because obviously STAN is, a, is an extremely powerful piece of software for Bayesian analysis. However, um, what I need it for is, is a very specific um, aspect. So um, I, I can, you know, I think I can optimize it if I, if I write the code myself. And um, we can see here that this, this is outputted our, our survival distribution. So it basically says that even though the user had maybe a, quite a strong belief that the survival was, uh, sorry, maybe about 35% at 400 weeks, um, the data is clearly um, overpowering this, and, and even the Gompert's assumption of exponentially increasing hazards kind of highlights that okay, it's not actually um, this this value here. It's it's um, the, the the posterior survival should be should be somewhere down here, which which is you know towards the tail end of the prior distribution as we would expect. Um, maybe I'll run it if. Hopefully this works if, if I have a real strong prior opinion. Sometimes it mightn't run. Anyway, I'm conscious of time. So um, yeah, if, if there's any questions, um, I don't know, I can't see. If there's any chat questions, I'll, I'll let John Luca. Uh, there's a couple of questions and uh, I also have a comment. So uh, the first question uh, is about, let me just go, Further up a bit, yes. Uh, what if you if you're required to elicit evidence from multiple clinical experts? How do you compile the information? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, I guess you could have a, a joint. You had have a prior on the, the um, survival. So, so, so um, we would, you, you know, a, a normal model of survival um, there's ways of eliciting you know um, how many observations this is worth and, and you know if, if one expert is more um, strongly opinionated than another that can be kind of kind of combined together into one and so then you could have like a survival distribution that um, in, that. in, in summary I, I, I think it's possible um, I just uh, I'm pretty sure it is possible, um, although I, it's a good point and, and something I might need to think more about. 
think it would be a, a, an exercise in elicitation from multiple experts um, as, as other cases exist, where you would have to perhaps define as some kind of consensus and uh, form a distribution over the, uh, the different opinions. Uh, and you may have all sorts of different tools to, to try and do that. And the shelf Sheffield assessment tool would, would, would kind of work towards that, I think. Um, there's another question which is about the technicalities of, of what you've done and uh, I'll add a comment myself later. So can you use packages such as Nimble um, and then uh, the, the, the person asking chat was suggesting Coda as well, but uh, as somebody else pointed out, Coda is not a package to do the Bayesian analysis, just to manipulate the output of the, of the MCMC algorithm. Um, so I don't know if you've played around with other software or if you have any um, opinion or comment on that. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, so there, you, you can't use Stan, no, sorry, you can't use Bugs or Jags. I don't know about Nimble. The reason why you can't use either of them is because um, uh, you can't define functions within the survival distribution, within the distributions in Bugs or Stan. Uh, as far as I'm aware, you can do it, uh, sorry, Bugs or Jags, but you can do that within Stan. Um, so that's the reason why you have to use Stan. Um, actually, it's not a difficult, like I've kind of wrote it myself in OR anyway, it's actually quite a simple procedure to do in just write your own Metropolis algorithm. I, I, and I, I'm pretty sure it works. Um, or it gives me the same results as the one in Stan did. So, so the advantage of doing you know, a, a Metropolis algorithm is that um, you could, I think in principle, incorporate the tree parameter distributions, um, which you can't do, you couldn't do with this approach in Stan. In my experience with working with this kind of things, uh, while I was developing, developing my own package, Stan was probably the best option because of what you were saying. So it's very easy in Stan to write a, like a chunk of code which defines a specific sampling distribution which isn't built in the, the development of Stan. So essentially, if you want to do a generalized F, as long as you know how the, the density should look like, you can write it and then you can use it when you're sampling. But more importantly, I think um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is very efficient for models such as survival analysis models, which have lots of censoring as well, which is often the case in, in, in health economic evaluation. Now, the example you're showing right now isn't the worst that I've seen. There are examples in, in, in HDA where the survival Kaplan-Meier curve doesn't even get to 50% because the data are very immature. Uh, maybe, you know, you go through phase three trial on, on um, speedy procedures. So um, uh, a, a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is very efficient and it's usually more efficient than standard give sampling, which is the basis of bugs and jugs and uh, nimble as well. Um, so I think there are good reasons why Stan is a very efficient software for doing this kind of models. And probably, I, I, I don't know, uh, obviously, on, on in, in your particular examples, but I would think that even in terms of uh, comparison with the Metropolis algorithm, uh, HMC would be more efficient, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, I, I, possibly, yeah, I, I think, though I, 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 it's more complicated, so um, I... I, I, I couldn't offer an opinion on that. The other thing I would add just to, to, to follow, follow up on what I was saying, which is a, a shameless plug on, on, on the work that I've been doing, but uh, I think you can link up all of your models to the development of Survey Chi, which doesn't need you to actually write down the stand code to run all of the standard health economics survival models, because they are implemented in Survey Chi as a, as a Bayesian version. So essentially what you're doing is you're playing with the priors and as, as long as you can define the priors in a, in a reasonable way, then you should be able to simply plug into survey sheet to do this, which might ease up the work. So this is something that uh, we can liaise offline if you want and if you're interested and it'd be cool. Sure, yeah, no, that sounds good. All right, um, is there any other question? I've seen that there was a request for a reference, but uh, um, the person who, who who actually was responsible for the reference has responded in the chat. So I think we are in the clear there. And so if there's no other question, uh, well, thank you very much again, uh, Philip. It was very, very interesting uh, talk. And uh, I think we can move on to the next one. So I'll give, um, thank you.
I'll give uh, Felicity Lamarock co-host rights. Felicity, I think you should be on right now. Yeah. Uh, sure. Can you hear me okay? You? Yeah, we can hear you. And we can see your screen as well. Okay. Over to you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks very much for uh, the opportunity to talk here. Um, yeah, it's been great so far, and hopefully I can add just a little bit more to a different area. Um, so yeah, today I was going to talk about um, calculating confidence intervals for transition probabilities. Um, really, what I'm going to look at is more to do with uncertainty um, in, in these transition probabilities in uh, cost-effectiveness modeling using this R package MSM. Um, and I know in the past you've had uh, Chris Jackson talk, but I, I'm kind of just looking at um, a little bit more of an application of that and some, some things that I've come across. Um, so yeah, um, oh, let me just go, there we go. Um, yeah, so just a little bit of background. Um, so I am um, a lecturer in data analytics at Queen's University Belfast. Um, I used to work at the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics. Um, in Dublin, so the HTI agency in, in Ireland. Um, I'm still a statistical advisor there, so I, I still work um, with some of the HTAs um, just from time to time and kind of take part in their kind of stats meetings. So I kind of get some insights to what's going on. Um, but this work is kind of what I've seen throughout sort of any cost effectiveness modeling that I've done myself um, and I've built and or I've reviewed and things like that. Um, and I say here, cost effectiveness models usually have a Markov component. I mean, they don't always, but um, ones that I've seen or ones that I've built um, do. And let me just. Oh, so um, I, I suppose this idea of multi state modeling is something that's coming up um, a bit more than in, in my experience anyway. And I have some students working on multi state models. Um, and so I've just shown a little diagram of a. a pretty simple multi-state model. Um, and uh, essentially, when we look at these, we're looking at movements in continuous time. So for example, someone who is healthy, um, they might uh, get a disease, um, but this could happen sort of at any moment in time. So they could transition from the health state, healthy to disease or um, move from disease to dead. Um, and I don't know if this is a, the, the correct word, but discretizing these for a cost effectiveness model. So you essentially are saying, okay, over the period of a cycle length, so a month or a year, whatever the cycle length is in a cost effectiveness model, um, we're discretizing uh, these movements to, to kind of see um, then if we can add up the, the costs and the qualities and things like that. And that's where we, we get our icers and things. So um, in trials or data that I look at, um, sometimes they don't have a lot of, of, of follow-up. So for example, you could get six months of follow-up, two years of follow-up. Um, the work that I did for this was on the FinRisk 97 data set. Um, and it was to do with uh, the risk of um, cardiovascular disease. So it was in Finnish data sets and they looked at um, about 13 years of follow-up. So I'd say full follow-up, but essentially I suppose, do we ever really have full follow-up? But um, that, that's what I worked on. But there's this, obviously a range of how much follow-up you have. Um, and these types of models, these multi-state models are, are more frequent. Um, and so, um, you know, this, this package MSM that Chris Jackson has, has developed is being used more and more. And it's something that I see more, but actually that I'm, um, getting students to use more and more, and I've used myself to build a cost effectiveness model. Um, and I say it's more frequent in the HTA submissions. Um, and so it's, it's quite uh, useful to kind of maybe highlight some of the things that, that, that I've learned from using it um, in terms of just this uncertainty. So um, oh. yeah, so I'll not go into too much detail. Um, this all is documented pretty well. It's a proportional hazards type model. Um, and there can be time varying characteristics. So here's the equation of this um, proportional hazards model. Um, so we have a Q matrix. So these are the instantaneous risks of movement between health state. So for example, the, the movement from health state R to health state, health state S um, uh, dependent on these, these time varying characteristics, so these covariates. 
So for example, in, in the models that I looked at for the FINRIX data, we looked at things like cholesterol, blood pressure, age, um, things that did actually change over time. And we had this longitudinal data set. And then um, that is uh, basically made up of this, the, what I call the, the Q base is what I'll, I'll show in, in the code, but essentially um, this is the equation um, using these time dependent covariates. So um, when we come to look at a cost effectiveness model, um, what we're interested in is the probabilities over a specific period of time. So the probability of uh, movement, for example, um, what is the probability that next year that I will move from healthy to post um, non-fatal stroke? Um, I would actually then take the exponential of that Q matrix over the, the year, that time period. Um, and the, the, the issue with this is that if I'm looking at the probability over 10 years, um, our Q matrix, um, these intensities uh, might not be um, constant. Um, so um, we have to kind of look at that, that, that time dependent and those, those changing uh, Q matrix values. So um, I guess the idea of this is we, we're seeing these MSM models use more or probabilities used um, and you could end up with an ICER or a probability or something like that. But in effect, it's a bit terrifying because uh, there are a lot of assumptions and we're really interested in knowing if we're making the right choice, whether or not that's um, an intervention uh, with the VIN risk data in terms of you know, uh, risk prevention or um, a clinical trial. So we're saying actually we've estimated the, the effectiveness of this drug and these are the probabilities of movements between these health states. Um, but actually are we looking at the uncertainty there? Um, because you know it depends what the research is used for, but I always like to highlight that uncertainty is probably a pretty big uh, part of, of any kind of analysis. So um, you do see uncertainty in models, uh, cost effectiveness models and the information coming from cost effectiveness models um, assessed. So the impact of, for example, probabilities on the cost effectiveness, it is, it is performed. It's more that parameter uncertainty. Um, the variance covariance matrix can be used and you see a, a PSA, this probabilistic sensitivity analysis performed or, or a, sort of a, a one-way sensitive analysis or something done. Um, quite often, I don't see bootstrapping done um, and that's why I have to put a picture of a tumbleweed because sometimes I'm sort of waiting for uh, okay something else like what what else is is there um, because I don't think this fully really addresses all of the components that go into the end model um, but actually along the conveyor belt of what actually goes into assessing these probabilities and then um, if there's a I don't know a network meta-analysis or something else the, the end uh, the end uncertainty is kind of used, but actually along that conveyor belt, are we addressing uncertainty the whole way through? Um, so when we're looking at probabilities, we actually probably need to uh, look at in this MSM package, what actually can be done to then see what that knock on effect is in terms of the, the uncertainty for the end result. So yeah, in MSM, there are a lot of things that are built in, which is kind of nice to see. Um, and I suppose I would encourage those to be done more. Um, and I think there are things like bootstrapping, um, piecewise modeling, things that are really, really good to use that, that maybe aren't used that often. Um, but some of the things that I just want to highlight are that we can um, do a few little things that maybe aren't, um, don't come as easily, but uh, things like adding covariates in the model one at a time. I'm using previous Q matrix. So the MSM model will um, sort of use a uh, sort of crude estimates to kind of kickstart the model um, and actually where those come from. And I'll, I'll show the, the code in a minute. Um, we could have these random starting values. Um, they could be within a range um, and take the best, best model really. Um, and something that I'm doing actually with, with a student is actually using sort of a, the Q matrix um, and actually looking at each um, sort of individual or, or calf, she's looking at young cows and actually looking at the probability, their individual probabilities um, over time to actually kind of flag those up. Um, and that's kind of a different way of looking at, at the problem. Um, so yeah, I 
can't really share a lot of the data that I've used in the past for this just because of confidentiality reasons. So I thought I would maybe just use the example that is inbuilt in MSM. Um, so I think it's Linda Sharples 